Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, in this back to school episode, um, we have Randall Fujimoto, the executive director and game based learning designer of Game Train Learning. Our topic is game based learning, and uh, we're looking forward to learning all about it. Welcome, Randall. Oh, thanks, Catherine. Good to be here. All right. So how did you get involved in esports? Let's see. So I got involved in the video game industry from the beginning. So I worked in the video game industry and um, after a while there, I decided to get into education, a high, kind of a higher calling, I guess. And, and in education, um, always the problem um, has been for, for quite a while is how do you make education more engaging? And so I thought with a with a gaming background, I kind of combine that with um, instructional design. I got a degree in instructional design and and um, decided to um, use gaming and game like thinking and trying to make education more engaging and enjoyable, like it should be. So my mission um, since that time, about um, eight nine years ago, is to um, use game based learning in all all phases of education from um, preschool all the way to adult. Um, how do you make education um, more game-like, more, more fun, engaging like a game? So um, I've been working on different game-based learning projects, um, programs for a while, and which brings us to eSports, which is the latest um, gaming, uh, game-based learning type program that I'm working on. So that brings us here. All right. So do you call it gamification? Um, good question. Question to get often asked. Um, so game-based learning is different from gamification. So gamification, uh, like literally is the, the technical term is, is making something that is not a game into something that's more like a game. Okay? So it's taking like chores and trying to make it into a game. Game-based learning, on the other hand, is, uh, is a, so I, is, is a broader term. It, it means um, it's not just using digital games um, or educational games. It's 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 using everything that that's a game um, or uh, game like thinking or gamified process like gamifying your classroom activities or lessons like that. So when when I think of uh, game based learning, I think of this broad area of using digital games, using analog games, using game design projects that kids are making games. And then using um, any other like new media, uh, VR, AR, all the new technologies, even um, in-person escape rooms or um, immersive. Uh, you've got you've got uh, in-person experiences like um, over here. I'm in the LA area, so uh, down in Disneyland, they've got uh, Galaxy Edge, where it's kind of like you're playing inside the Star Wars games, right? Mm -hmm. So, so things like that are all. If if we add learning to that. Um, and, and folks don't learn that's game based learning. And so gamification is a subset. I consider that a subset of the whole universe of game based learning. Okay, so there's an escape room in Waikiki. If I go to that, is that a game based learning experience? It is a game based learning experience if <laughs> there's learning going on. So oh. generally, escape rooms are just solve a puzzle, solve a puzzle, solve a puzzle, but it could be a math escape a game-based learning experience that if every puzzle is related to math, right, then it becomes a game-based learning experience. Okay. Now, I mean, I have another example for you. Okay. Um, my brother and I, we uh, use Duolingo all the time, and we're learning a whole bunch of different languages and, you know, kind of trying to rack up the points and learn, you know, various languages. Is that game-based learning or is that gamification? That's more gamification. Um, it is taking language learning, which is typically taught just by, you know, just by repeating after me or something like that, or identify the vocabulary. It's taking that and and adding game elements, game mechanics to it, like your points or your levels or whatever. It also added a, a story mode, right? Um, that's what sure. I heard. Yeah, that's supposed yeah. to be pretty fun. So that that's um, so when you think about um, gamifying something, it's um, it works when it it uh, focuses on the intrinsic motivators. So things like adding a story gives the the player or the user 
like a purpose in continuing on, right? So very, it's motivating that way. It's not so much this point or this gold star, I wanna do that, which is an extrinsic motivator. Those types of systems usually don't work or, or last for very long, but um, sure. yeah. But the, the way that they're doing it, I think the story mode has a lot of promise. Okay. Okay, so when I was in school, um, there was no game-based learning as far as I could tell. It was just, le you learn, and uh, we're not going to make this fun. Um, at what point did game-based learning um, come into fashion in our history? Hmm. Um, okay, let's see. <clears throat> if I can give you, give you a little history lesson as far as I know. that, that um, So remember like, there's a, a game called Oregon Trail? Like, a long time ago and and uh, they just did a remake of it so looking into the like history of it but that was um i don't know when that was uh, the 70s or so um but that was just like the simple like um graphic of this wagon going across the, the country and learning about history of, of the oregon trail and so that was uh, one of the first successful i guess what they called edutainment back then um and um it started to <clears throat> that that got popular along with um, maybe a couple of the games, and then so that got got software companies thinking that this is a good area to go into because obviously they want to make money. But they found that it was very hard to get these games really popular and good and and fun and make them fun and get them into schools and into kids' hands. So they found that business model very tough. So it kind of took a dip down, um, and then maybe in the early two thousands we started seeing more. Um, more interest in game-based learning and in use maybe that's a time um things like minecraft right came onto the scene and instead of being an entertainment game that the, they found that oh we can use this to like teach math or teach english or, or or teach like different things just using this entertainment game and then there's been, there became this renewed interest in using games in schools and then we also realized that we are in the uh gamer generation where um kids and even the young teachers right they grew up with nintendo or, or atari or whatever and they and so so this whole gamer generation um is is here now and and our our medium of today happens to be games you know like before it was like videos and then before that it was like like uh pictures and books but today um we've got like almost every kid is an adult almost is, is a gamer and so to me what this means is that um that we have a whole generation that thinks and learns differently they think and learn like a gamer does because we played thousands and thousands of hours of games, right? So obviously that playing, doing something over and over and over, it affects how you think and how you behave. And actually it physically rewires the brain, the, the, uh, the amount of gaming that we've done. And so how does that manifest in behavior is that it, this is what I call a, a gameful mindset, meaning that um, I go through uh, like the gameful mindset person goes through life thinking and learning a little bit differently than in previous generations. So for example, uh, the gamer expects continuous feedback for everything, right? We want to, we move our character, we move our avatar a little bit, we do something, we get feedback from the game immediately. And, and we expect feedback for every single thing we do. But then you contrast that with schools, right? You turn in an essay, maybe a few days later, maybe you get it back with a grade and maybe that's it, right? And then you move on. So you've got a lot of, you know, of summative assessment in schools, right? So it's, it's a lot of summative assessment, but in games, it's all formative assessment. And so you're getting a whole bunch of formative assessment, which is what gamers expect. And so that, that's, you know, one of the very, one of the many characteristics of the, the game for mindset. Another key one, um, related kind of related to that is that is that with all this feedback you expect to fail over and over but you 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 you're okay with it you so you embrace failure and you learn from that and you learn how to iterate and 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 you experiment you're okay with experimenting and then iterating and learning from that so this is how the gamer approaches school approaches um career approaches life right they approach it through the lens of a gamer and this is this is where um we need to have our schools and our activities that the kids do. We need to have them um, on the same wave, same wavelength, right? In order to really connect with students. So, sure. 
Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting thing. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, um, I interviewed Dexter Carr Jr. and we talked about uh, uh, kind of the gamer generation and I call them Gen G. And so, you know, it's interesting because as you talk about that, I'm thinking as an employer, I have a law firm that I have had employees that require more feedback than what I would think would be normal. And so I do think that perhaps in business environments, that perhaps the employers need to understand this Gen G and that they need feedback on a more significant or more frequent basis um, than um, other generations. What do you think of that? Yeah, I fully agree. And I think uh, as like, as you know, the next few years or so, we'll get the hiring managers also as gamers. So they kind of understand that. And they'll say that, that, oh, our old method doesn't work, that we need to, um, we need to ask different questions. We need to give like maybe more interactive type of thing um, and, and give, give uh, much better, much more prompt feedback. So um, I think as we go along, we kind of understand how the gamers think. And, and as more people are gamers, then we get more into that, that type of mode. Sure. You know, and I, I think that if you're looking at um, the gameful mindset in schools, and if you're thinking about gamification and game-based learning in schools, then I think you could actually expand it to uh, apply to work and apply, to, apply it to industry and apply it to what you know to have more effective workplaces what do you think about that oh definitely yeah and you already see that with um with um like gamified sales systems that uh right you try to like um you're you're going through your sales and you're actually going through a game and you're actually playing a game with the other sales people kind of thing so the more it can become a, an actual a real game the more invested you get into it and then the, the more it feels like you're, you're playing a game and less like you're just doing actual actual work. So I think we'll, we'll see quite a bit of that. Um, and, and this is where innovation comes in. And, and um, if we need, we need uh, students that graduate that can think that way and that have creative minds. And uh, I think, um, you know, shows like this obviously help because they, they help expand uh, your mindset and, and your thinking and, and your ideas. So, um, I definitely think we'll see that in, in the workplace as, as we go forward. So tell us more about your company, Game Train Learning. Yeah, so um, basically the mission is to focus on how to make all education more engaging through uh, the use of game-based learning. And, um, and so any projects that we take on um, have um, the, the, uh, a direct impact on um, on how to change education and how to introduce new ideas into education that that are more um, game like and more um, more engaging for students. So, um, like I have, uh, or maybe working on maybe about half a dozen different projects right now, and so all of them all have the same focus. They might have different different demographics, um, different areas, but um, they all have the same focus. So, if I can talk about uh, this esports program that I'm involved in, um, since it's an esports show, uh, that uh, we approach esports not like other um, other like esports startups. Most most of them are focused on on making leagues and on you know, like um, um, like gathering teams and and um, like. Uh, creating that infrastructure, we're focused on what are the educational benefits of it, of esports, and so looking at it from a game based learning standpoint, <laughs> um, we so the the in, the soft skills or life skills or social emotional intelligence, uh, all those types of 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 non cognitive skills, whatever you want to call them, are so important in in a child, in a student, in an adults. Um, like future, future in, in everything. And so, um, so I'm a big believer in, in the importance of these skills. And so we, we took a look at, um, at the universe of soft skills and analyzed uh, about 165 different soft skills in this universe. And we partnered with uh, a research university and 
ask them which of these soft skills uh, can we um, can actually be measured one and and can be and are malleable can be developed. So out of these soft skills, they came up with a list of thirty three, and then they looked at all the research and then narrowed it down to these thirty three skills. And out of these thirty three skills. We looked at esports and we said, which of these skills can we uh, both assess and develop in esports? And um, we came away with a framework of 15 different skills. And we, we, we grouped those into five different categories, leadership, communication, teamwork, problem solving, and character. And through the, our esports program, we help kids develop all 15 of these skills. They, they under, we assess them, give them prompt feedback, continuous feedback, and then help them develop these 15 skills just by playing esports on their teams. So that's our whole premise is, is we help kids become better humans by simply by playing esports because they are developing, and they see that they're developing these critical life skills. What games are they playing? So um, our program is actually game agnostic. So they can be playing any team game. We started off with League of Legends and um, we also use, um, we're, we're doing a Minecraft program. Um, we want to do um, basically any any popular esports games that are out there, and then also we're we're looking at our platforms so because we're basically an analytics company. We take in data and then we we analyze it and we say you are good or deficient in these areas and these skills, and this is the way you can improve them, and this is what it also means for your future careers. What type of careers um, could, if you excel at these areas, what type of careers can you excel at? So we're actually program agnostic you know, as long as it's a team activity so we can we're we're gonna um expand into like regular sports and into other into classroom project-based lesson um and so any team activity we can use our platform terrific and it's called we think by the way so it's oh, we think okay yeah. sure um okay you know so it's kind of interesting because a lot of there's been a lot of growth in esports in the last few years and certainly during the pandemic uh, but you're, you've been around for a while. So how has this recent um, huge kind of uh, increase in the visibility of esports impacted your com you and your company? Oh, it's, it's huge. Um, I mean, it seems like everybody has heard of esports now, which is a big thing because before you mentioned esports, they kind of blank look, but now you mention it to, you know, even parents or whoever, and they go, oh yeah, I've heard of that. So, so that, that's a big hurdle. And then also just getting the acceptance of, of gaming as, uh, as a, um, a, a, a real, uh, like a profession or a pastime that, that is valuable. And that's not just some um, teenage kid in a basement thing, right? And, it, and so just raising the level and awareness of gaming as, uh, as a media, right? As as a viable um, and for me a viable and probably the maybe the best learning medium that's out there because um, games, as opposed to videos or books or whatever other media, um, games are by definition like active, right? So they're interactive. So so therefore you have to be active in order to consume the media. So. Therefore, um, and we know that, you know, there's no real learning without active learning. And so it forces you to be active. So you just can't slough off and kind of like semi watch a lecture and then say, oh, yeah, I, I, I learned it um, because, you know, you probably listed about 10 percent of it. But if you're playing a game in order to get to the next part, next level, you have to actively participate, so actively learn. Sure. And, you know, it's interesting to me that um, now, you know, games and esports is more of a common thing, but you've been doing this for a while. So was there a time that if someone asked you what you did for a living and you explained it, you got some puzzled looks? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, I mean um, yeah, to, to make the connection with games and education and then have to go over why games are can be good but it, you know what really helps is that there's there's so much research now on game-based learning on very different on all these different areas of game-based learning so there's so much new interest like just in the past 10 years or so and you've got a lot of universities have you know um, not only game design programs but also research in 
in games and how they, they are effective in, in the education space. So I think as we get more acceptance and more, um, more just visibility and um, it just becomes like in the future, it won't be game-based learning. It'll just be learning because everybody kind of expect everything to feel like be game-like. So that, right. that's my vision of the future. Sure. And, and you I'll know what? Be, then I'll just be learning designer, no game-based learning designer. Right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> you know, so it's interesting because I do get emails every day of research done in esports and gaming, and they're generally at the PhD, master's, collegiate level. They're producing these papers. And, you know, the amount of research is phenomenal because I would say that every day at least I get one. So, uh, you know, one email of a new paper. And, you know, so it's, it, it is a really common thing, although a lot of people may not realize how much, how much uh, of a research topic this is. Um, so, um, what, what is the future um, for um, your company and game-based learning aside from what you've discussed? Well, I think, so this kind of, this pandemic, like remote and then hybrid and then back in person and then maybe back to hybrid or something. It, it's an interesting, um, well, it's an interesting time, of course, but it's an interesting time for innovation and an interesting time for, um, for um, using and, and so different um, types of game-based learning like activities, right? So we can have um, remote escape games or even hybrid escape escape games or in person like so when you when you combine like um um sort of an immersive theater so what, one of my projects is trying to combine immersive theater with escape gaming and having the immersive theater telling a story um uh, but then having the escape games adding that interactivity um and so uh how do you merge these two and how do you make them in person hybrid remote only and make them fun, uh, enjoyable, participatory learning experiences. So I think where we're kind of headed is more innovation in all the different spaces, and especially with new technologies coming in with VR becoming cheaper and AR solutions and phones becoming more, um, you know, better phones, more ubiquitous, more, uh, more capacity. And, and so I think all the, all the different um, technology and all the different ideas, and especially when we get kids graduating as game designers or as thinking like gamers um, will get just more and more innovation into the space. And then, you know, it'll be just become learning again. Everything will be fun and interactive. And, and that's where we want to get to is, is learning. You go through your whole school career and learning is fun the whole way through, not a drudgery. Sure. And then people will go, oh, no, I have to work. <laughs> and, but and we want to make work fun, too. True. That's absolutely true. And people will not want to be at home because that's not as doing chores is not as exciting <laughs> as all of this gaming. So now um, how you mentioned virtual reality, you mentioned mobile games. So how impactful are those two on what you're doing? Uh, VR, not as much right now, because I think we're still in the phase of adoption that we it's um uh, you know, we, it's come down in price and more and more people have it, but it's still, um, it's still limited to those that can afford it. So, so I like to work on programs. Basically my, kind of my philosophy is, is just to try to work on programs that can reach like the inner cities in the mess. So I do work with the inner city of LA schools there. And so what can kids there do, or even, you know, in, in, in rural areas or even in poor countries, what can we do to, bring this game-like environment into those areas. So um, one, one idea that um, uh, my immersive escape game idea first um, started off as, how can we turn an ordinary classroom, use some sheets to cordon off the room and make different rooms in there? And then how can we tell a story and make it like a little escape game in just a classroom using like basic materials that any teacher can use or any, any uh, and that doesn't cost a whole bunch. So I think with VR, I like, you know, wait to come down in price to, to have to where everybody has it. With V with A with AR though, I think with phones um, and it 
you know, you know with, with uh, all the technology being, being integrated into the phones and even cheaper phones, then once that happens and everybody can, you know, we've got everybody playing Pokemon Go when it came out too. So uh, I think that has um, bigger potential for, for mass adoption right now. So that's, I think that's where I want to think of next. And so one idea I have, I could share is that, that um, how to map um, an environment. So you can map in like a historical story and map it onto like a playground or a school ground, right? And you can have them going through their school ground, but then actually in AR, it's the historical environment and you can have them go through quests and things like that and living inside that historical environment. Yeah. Oh, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I wonder if you could, um, do, you could do like an actual esports competition out there in AR. That's another thing to think about. Sure. Wow. That's, that is really a terrific idea. So um, let me just ask you are you having, are there, is there any pushback from parents about what you're doing? Oh, yeah. All the time. I mean, and traditional teachers that have been there for years, right? Then, you know, they don't want to change from their, you know, binder of lesson plans to something different. Uh, and then parents, you know, obviously you've got still the stigma of games just being some frivolous pastime. So, but once they see like um, one benefit of like of a game-based learning experience of maybe just a Minecraft game that, that teaches a little bit of math or something, once they see that, uh, then they say, then it kind of opens their eyes a little bit saying that, okay, it's not just a complete waste of time. And so, uh, it's still a sell to, to a lot of people, but I think the more that you know we're in this space and that we're sharing things like this, um, and the more the awareness level is uh, is is risen. So so I think um, we we will hit a threat. We'll hit a, a point where where most people are okay with it, and then we'll really take off. I think. Sure, um, and that might be a, a new era. Um, uh, even. Uh... Uh, so much exciting stuff. And so um, uh, let's conclude by having you tell us about um, how people can contact you if they want to invest in what you're doing or if they want to uh, seek uh, game-based learning from your company. Yeah, so you can contact me on um, website. Um, probably in the notes, but it's gametrainlearning.org. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, you just search for my name. Uh, and Twitter is under Game Train Learn. Also, um, my um, esports um, company is at wethinkinc.us. And I wonder if we can put that in the notes too. Um, so you can take a look at what we're doing there. Um, and so, yeah. You can contact me anytime, any of those places. Oh, one other thing for any educators out there, I am um, I run a uh, uh, game-based learning certificate program for educators through Cal State Fullerton, so you can look it up there. Fantastic. Well, Randall, thank you so much. We learned so much today from you, and I hope everyone who's watched will uh, contact you. Great. Thanks, Catherine. It's, it's always fun talking about education, and uh, I can do this all day. So thanks all for right. Having. So uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be Seth Shore. We'll be talking about Ninth Isle Esports. And if you don't know, uh, um, Hawaii is uh, the other islands and Las Vegas is the Ninth Island. See you then. Aloha. <laughs>